All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our Storm of the Month. This is our first one in our kind of regularly scheduled series. If you all have been attending our Storm of the Months for the past several months, uh, those were co-hosted with Jim Ledoux at WDTD, who um, is also on a detail with NIST, so it, they had kind of wind damage estimation um, and DAT-focused presentations with some of his partners through NIST. Uh, but now we're back to our usually scheduled programming. Well, I wanted to kick back off the Storm of the Month series uh, after a, a long hiatus since the COVID period when we did it in 2020. And so this is our first one. We've got Ben Lott, a meteorologist from the uh, Binghamton, New York, WFO, and he'll be talking about the aftermath of the September 25th, 2022 Walton, New York tornado. Um, and with that, Ben, that's it for me. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you. So I'm going to start out with uh, my professional and radar background. Before I joined WFO Binghamton, I was actually at a National Data Buoy Center for around three years, uh, analyzing buoy data. Um, I wanted to make the jump uh, to a WFO, so I joined Binghamton in July of 2020. I did not complete RAC until November of 2021, and 2021 was the year that WDTD was doing virtual workshops, uh, so Binghamton was essentially my Norman. And uh, with this event, I had roughly a year of radar experience. Uh, so our county warning area, it covers uh, central New York and northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, but our focus today is going to be just on Broome and Delaware counties of New York. So on September 25th, uh, I walk into the office. I'm working an evening shift. Uh, it was an overtime shift I picked up. I chose to pick it up because I was going into my midnight shifts uh, within a couple of days. So using the evening shift to help transition my sleep schedule, I thought that would be beneficial. Uh, knowing that it was going to be a severe potential day, I, I grab my rack binder, head to my workstation. Anytime I know that it will be severe weather, I always grab this and I use some of the guides within it. Uh, I look at the environment. You know, I see what's on the you know, analysis maps by the Weather Prediction Center. I look at mesoanalysis uh, from the Storm Prediction Center website. And one more thing, uh, September 25th is my birthday. So when I got in, I would have been looking at the 18Z uh, WPC surface analysis. We had a low over Lake Ontario with a warm front out ahead of a trailing cold front. So I did put part of our region into the warm sector uh, this day. Uh, for the outlook, we had general thunder for our northern half of our CWA. For the southern half, we were mostly in a marginal, but there was a slight risk that just clipped our southern uh, northeastern Pennsylvania counties. And within that slight risk, there was also a 2% tornado risk that essentially outlined the slight risk like almost perfectly. But still, kind of thinking about it, the tornado risk was more for the rest of like eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and you know a couple other states further south. Uh, so here's a snippet from the rack binder, and I actually black out part of this for now because this is the this chart is the updated version of what I had. But the things that are blacked out are things that were not in my rack binder when I took it, or at least not on the cheat sheet that I looked at. And so this is the criteria that we're looking for for a near storm environment for missile cyclonic tornadoes. You know, you want an STP greater than one. You, know, you obviously want some cape, not much sin, low LCL heights, an SRH value of 150 or greater, and an effective block wind difference of around 40 or even greater. Uh, now, with the updated guide, um, they have provided some necessary values, and at the time, I, I did not quite understand the role that the zero to one kilometer shear would play uh, into a possible tornado event. Again, this is just the updated guy pulled straight from the guy that they'll be using for rack this year, I assume, uh, with some necessary values and then the preferred value. And uh, what I like to do when I'm using those values, looking for those values, I like to go to uh, the College of DuPage website uh, because their soundings have all of this information on it, uh, all the indices. And so I've highlighted uh, everything except for I forgot to highlight the surface of one kilometer shear. And I'll just kind of circle that here with my cursor. 
Now that was 28 knots, so that was pretty good. We did have low LCL heights, but everything else really didn't meet the criteria. And our STP value was basically zero. Now the sounding I pulled shortly after the event uh, is very moist, likely contaminated with uh, some convection. Uh, so I do show a slightly better sounding, uh, but still we were really kind of lacking the instability uh, in Broome and Delaware counties. Uh, and, while, and even the shear values weren't even that good either. So um, while, yes, this isn't the best looking sounding, for the most part, the indices really weren't that much different. But uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm working radar at this point. I'm looking, you know, have, have my eyes on it. And uh, I see a storm that pops up uh, just northeast of Binghamton. And I, I kind of see a higher reflectivity there, which I uh, highlight there with the white circle. And I start going through my scans. And with GR2, you can easily do this. You can get a nice 3D model of what the higher elevations look like. And I saw this core on this storm. And I had two thoughts uh, with this. Uh, while we weren't really expecting like a downburst sort of environment, it really doesn't take much to knock down a tree here in the Northeast. So I, I figure, well, if this core does fall out, maybe the winds will be strong enough to you know, knock over some trees. Or uh, this is a pretty nice looking core. It's probably some decent sized hail in it. So either way, uh, I'm gonna put a severe warning on this storm. and. That's what I did. And we did have to ask for reports because we didn't really hear anything on the scanners, but we did get this from Facebook. Uh, that Someone did have a one inch size hail. So that was great. Verify that warning. Uh, feeling pretty good about the evening so far. And so at this point, uh, the storm did weaken and it exited Broome County and it began to approach and move into Delaware County. So revisiting the rack binder, here's a, a snippet of the impact base warning guide. And for you know your base warning for tornadoes, you want a 30 knot V-rod and an STP greater than zero. That's what you're looking for. There are some other things that you can look for as well that maybe help boost your confidence. Um, for example, you know, some higher reflectivity, co-located with the velocity, you know, CC below 0.9. Uh, ZDR near zero, but it's not necessary. So, you know, this is what I was looking for anything this day, was that 39 V rod. All right, so Walton here is uh, kind of outlined here by this dot, and this GIF does move pretty quickly, so I'll, I'll replay it again. And when I was looking at this storm, I thought, wow, this, this storm has kind of a weird curve to it on the reflectivity. Um, and, you know, there is some broad rotation, but the, the V-Rot was 20, 25 knots at best. Uh, so it, it, in my mind, it really didn't deserve a tornado warning. Uh, there wasn't much of a core to the storm, uh, and there was very little lightning. So in my mind, you know, it, it almost seemed just like a shower, uh, just an oddly shaped shower. It really didn't feel like I needed to warn on this storm. Uh, so there was no severe warning. There's no tornado warning. Uh, I didn't even put out an SPS uh, on this storm, which maybe that would have at least been the best thing to do. Uh, but this was around 5.30 p.m. And just kind of taking a look at some of the other scans up above before a uh, tornado touchdown. You know, our VROT maybe looking a little bit better at 0.9, but still it was below that threshold. Uh, and we still have some rotation at 1.4 level, but not quite as tight, uh, even more broad. So again, the storm went unwarned. And as a result, we saw all these comments on Facebook. Uh, trees were knocked down, structures were damaged, roofs were torn off. I saw all these comments, I'm thinking, what happened? What did I miss? Like, there, like that storm, it, it didn't look like anything. How did it do all this damage? And it looked way better when it was in Broome County. And so the emergency manager did request us to come out and do a survey. And while most of the damage was EF0 damage, there was an EF1 rated damage near the end of the path. It was on the ground for a short period of time. Uh, 
path length was only two and a half miles. Uh, it was on the ground for less than three minutes. Uh, so it's just there south of Walton. And I do believe what happened is that we had that warm front out ahead. Uh, the storm approached that warm front. That warm front provided the shear needed for some rotation. I also pointed out that the low level shear was pretty good as well. Uh, so, you know, kind of combining those things, that's probably what uh, really helped get this little spin up going, support it for just a few minutes. Uh, so here's some survey photos uh, that were taken. Uh, there's some trees down on, on a structure here, trees down on a house, you know, a couple larger trees or moderate sized trees blown over. Uh, this picture here, uh, this was a car repair shop. Uh, it had a metal roof. Uh, the survey crew did say that this really wasn't fastened down very well, uh, but still the winds were able to just kind of peel this roof right off of the building. And there was even a piece that was blown into a truck that they had parked there. Uh, there's also some wood in the lower uh, right-hand corner there that was probably also blown off the roof. And then here, uh, there were some uh, more trees that were knocked down. Uh, you can see the barn in the background. It uh, also has a metal roof that did start to peel, but not completely off like we saw with that uh, auto shop. So that's a little review of, of the storm and, you know, the, the thought process I went through when, you know, working the radar. And I'm going to kind of transition now into the aftermath part of this event. And I start with this quote. We've all seen it. We've all heard it. And I would argue that it's not nice to be wrong uh, because we strive to be right. You know, we want to be right. We want to make the right decision. And so the public, they just don't quite understand it. Like, yeah, it, you know, we are getting a paycheck, but we don't enjoy being wrong. There's, there's nothing nice about it. So I start off here by kind of talking about my feelings. You know, how did I feel afterwards? Well, I felt shocked first off. You know, I saw those Facebook comments coming in and, I had to go back and I looked at, you know, I was like reviewing things and I was wondering, you know, how did I miss something like this? You know, and what, what if people have been injured or worse? You know, and thankfully, uh, people, they, they noticed the strong winds and they took shelter uh, pretty quickly, uh, thankfully. Uh, they were quick to react. Uh, I think there was a story where there was a family eating dinner and heard the winds blowing outside and they, they quickly went down to the basement. So, you know, thankfully, it wasn't worse than what it was, but still, and I couldn't believe I missed something like this. I felt annoyed. Uh, the survey, you know, it was everywhere I looked, uh, especially social media. You know, we even have some work group chats, you know, that I was posted in. Uh, so, you know, even after shift, you know, I was just seeing this survey everywhere and reminded, hey, I never got a warning out on this storm. But in the end, I did feel relieved eventually. Uh, many of my colleagues, they, they agree that they also probably would not have worn on that storm, um, just kind of based on the training that we have all received. And I sat down with my managers, especially my MIC, and he, he told me, hey, look, I'm not concerned about this. You, you were making a decision that you thought was best. You know, don't worry about it. So, so that felt good. I also kind of took into my own hands to do uh, a personal event review, uh, as well as kind of review this with some of my colleagues. Uh, I, I show uh, this four panel radar here because the mid midnight shift, they came in um, and started looking at this storm as well. And that's when one of them pointed out Enrod, uh, which you can get on GR2. For this storm, it was only around 0.65, while research says you, know, you need around 0 0.8, 0 0.81. Also, NROT's really good for you know, helping assist with key LCS systems. But still, you know, it was nice to see that you know, there was a spike in this and, and learn that this product does exist. There was also a spike in spectrum width, which at this point, when you have a spike in spectrum width, uh, the tornado is likely already on the ground. In this case, it would have been on the ground for a very short period of time, so I would have had to get a warning out quickly if I had, you know, seen this or paid attention to spectrum width. 
I also reach out to uh, some friends, especially those that work in the weather service. You know, I've got a few uh, that work kind of all around the country, and I talk to them the night of the event, and even days after, I just kind of talk it out, how I felt, you know, just, you know feeling down, and, and just trying to get some encouragement you know, about missing, you know, a, a tornado. The lead forecaster I work with that night, uh, he actually reached out to me the following day, making sure I wasn't being too hard on myself, uh, making sure you know, I, I was okay uh, with how the you know the previous night events had played out. Uh, you know that was really thoughtful uh, for him to do that. I did go, you know, I went about my life. One of the errands I, I do remember, I was at the grocery store the following day. Uh, I also had my mid shifts coming up like a night or two later, so. I knew that I had to just kind of you know, pick myself back up and get ready to work those shifts. But I also have a couple cats, and I spent time with them. Uh, this is Boris and Natasha. Natasha's in the foreground. There's Boris in the background. Uh, you know, pets are great. You know, they love you. They come up to you every time you walk in a door. So it's always great to just kind of spend time with them, play with them, pet them, and that just really helps relieve the stress and take your mind off of things. Would I do anything differently? Um, first, you know, I felt like I did a good job of analyzing the environment. Um, and I knew the location of the fronts, but my problem was I didn't remember where those fronts were you know, at the time those storms fired off. Uh, so I think you know, the biggest thing is maybe slow down just a little bit and just kind of you know, mentally note not only the environment, but note the location of fronts. And to actually help me with that, I have updates on my radar procedures. I actually have a WPC surface analysis on uh, one of my radar procedures that I will now use for severe weather. I've also, you know, have picked up some other tools that I could use, uh, especially for days that have spin-ups. Uh, even so, I, I would still be hesitant to put a warning out, uh, even a tornado warning. Um, I think you know if I could if I see something like this again, maybe a severe with a tornado possible tag would be an option. Uh, but again, I would have had to be really quick to get a tornado warning out there because by the time it showed up on radar, I would have only had you know 30 seconds a minute to get a warning out, and then by the next scan, it was already lifted. So it's possible that I would have you know had a missed event and a false alarm if I wasn't quick enough. So I think that's how I would have handled it differently if I'm faced with something like this again. Probably not going to volunteer to work on my birthday if I'm already scheduled off. It's different if I'm scheduled, but this was certainly a birthday to remember, and I'm not going to forget about this birthday probably ever. Uh, so, yeah, that might be the last time I volunteer to work on my birthday. And avoid the office's social media page. So when I came back in the office for my first mid-shift, I was kind of going through comments, and I saw this one. And we provide a service to the public. You know, they, they see everything we do. They have the right to criticize us. Uh, but still, you know, even reading these comments, you know, just simply asking us all to do better, you know, that, that was just kind of a second blow to me missing this event. You know, I had kind of a rush of all those, the feelings coming back of, man, I, I really messed up. You know, so those are things I would definitely do differently uh, the next time I'm faced with something like this. Uh, there were some positives with this event. I, you know, I'm very lucky to have a very supportive staff. You know, I've kind of already highlighted that the night shift reviewed this event when they came in. The lead reached out to me the next day. The managers were very understanding of my decision making. You know, I, I never felt any criticism from any of them. And I just really felt the support that they all provided. You know, I learned a value of a missed event early in my career, actually. Again, you know, I've only been in the weather service for around three years, but I only have just over a year of radar experience. And so I think this was a good lesson to learn uh, to how to deal with my emotion, with the emotional and mental impacts that come with something like this. And also, you know, having that support that I received, you know, I can now apply that same support to you know, a young forecaster, you know, somewhere down the road that may be in the same boat that I was in uh, with this event. And so I believe this is my last slide. I'm going to end with you know some advice I've received or, or picked up along the way with 
you know, not only dealing with missed events, but mistakes. And the very first one is pretty common. It's just learn from your mistakes. And we do that in the weather service. We do event reviews when we miss a big event or we go back and we like to look at, see the things that we did right, but also see the things that we did wrong. You know, every mistake is a learning opportunity, whether it's a missed event or just a mistake in general. You know, just take the time to learn from it. Recognize signs that you're not okay. You know, I kind of shared some of you know how I was feeling. You know, I certainly had a change in mood or behavior. Uh, other people may react differently, and you just have to recognize those signs. Well, there's been a couple times just on this job where I've just notice that my mood has changed and it's very difficult to leave everything at the door that may be bothering you and not bring it into the office. I mean, that's okay. Um, you know, we're human. We're going to have feelings. We're going to have, you know, changes. Um, just be aware of those, those signs. It goes the other way too. If you, you know, notice a coworker just isn't themselves, you know, it's okay to bring that up to them. You know, if you have to pull them aside and just ask like, okay, are you all right? You know, are you, you know, is everything fine? Um, they're they're going to want that support. Uh, so definitely just be aware of those things. Talk to someone afterwards. Uh, we are lucky this agency has started to emphasize behavioral health and wellness. Uh, we have Lieutenant Commander Valerie Gardner to talk to. Uh, also, that second bullet point, you could talk to any of those folks. Um, I have talked to friends. I've talked to family. You know, I have talked with colleagues and managers. I've even talked to a therapist. Uh, not necessarily about work, but you know, seeking professional help, it, it really can be beneficial. And it's certainly a route that you can always take um, if you don't feel fully supported by, you know, maybe those around you or if they don't quite understand. And the last thing I'll say is just don't let it stop you from going about your life. You know, I mentioned I was running errands. Uh, I also like to go out and do my hobbies because the hobbies really take my mind off of anything I'm dealing with. I like to play disc golf. I like to play regular golf. And anytime I'm on the course, I forget about what's happening outside of my life because you know, I'm having fun and I'm focused on just my hobbies and my activities. And be social. You know, if someone invites you, you know, out or you know, like, you know, there's a work gathering, you know, just go out, be social. Don't don't sit at home and let, give yourself time to think about it. You know, find distractions. Just keep your mind off of whatever happens and hopefully you, know, you quickly kind of forget about it and be able to move on. Uh, with that, uh, that's all I've got and I'll take any questions. All right. Thank you, Ben. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed this being our first kind of kickoff of this, this storm of the month series um, because, you know, I think we, we don't always talk about these kinds of details, you know, I, I give Ben a lot of credit for coming out here and talking about an event um, that he feels like he could have done better on, but also the mental aspect and the wellness portion of it too. And we are a family here, and I like that you had folks you could lean into, and I like that you talked about um, resources that are out there and, and maybe things that other folks can keep in mind if they go through the same type of situation. So, you know, thank you for, for talking through this kind of event with everyone here. Again, thank you, Ben, for your conversation today and for kicking off our new series and thank you all for joining for this first one. We're trying to keep with the fourth Wednesday of the month so our next one is going to be June 28th at 11 a.m. Central and for that one we have another Ben. We have Ben Herzog out of the St. Louis office who's going to talk about a giant hail um, event that they had in April and maybe some misleading radar signatures. So uh, we have the same registration for all of our Storm of the Month, so feel free to go back and register for that one. And so again, thank you all, and um, hope to see you at future ones.